I'm going to start out with a couple questions. The first question, who has used their cell phone in the last five minutes? Come on, don't lie. I see you checking it out there. Who has used their GPS in the last three hours? Who has flown in an airplane in the last 30 days? OK, one more question. What entity, with their investment in tech, has had the most impact? Google? How about Apple? Maybe a more traditional company, Lockheed Martin? Would you believe it if I told you, Uncle Sam, your government? Now listen, TEDx Boca is about reinvention. And tonight I'm going to talk about the reinvention of government tech into the products and services that we can't live without. Now one of them comes to mind, GPS. Now I'm an old guy, been around a long time, and the first time I saw a GPS, I flew with it in this airplane right here in the Persian Gulf. The GPS was not integrated into the cockpit. They gave it to us in a box, and the box was about this big. But even then, I could see what GPS might become. And I think we can all think of the predecessor of the internet, the ARPANET. In 1969, the government funded the ARPANET, and that connected scientific research establishments across the nation. But what else? Let's go deeper. The way we can do go deeper tonight is take a little journey, a little thought journey. Let's plan and execute some travel. So if you're like me, you're planning your travel on your cell phone or on your personal computer. And those incredibly powerful and useful devices would not exist without the integrated circuit. But to understand the need for the integrated circuit, we got to go back in the way back machine, way back to the first general purpose electronic computer. <clears throat> it was called the ENIAC. And the ENIAC was a huge machine. The ENIAC weighed 60,000 pounds. It was funded by the US Army in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania. The New York Times said about the ENIAC, it performs mathematical tasks at the speed of light, hitherto too complex or difficult for solution. But as I said, this thing was huge. It wouldn't fit into your house, let alone the palm of your hand. And the ENIAC had some other problems. The ENIAC was comprised of this, vacuum tubes. These vacuum tubes were connected by wire. And that connection of wire and vacuum tubes caused something the designers called the tyranny of numbers. The tyranny of numbers meant that as I wanted to increase the performance of my machines, I needed more tubes and more wire. Well, enter the integrated circuit. In 1959, a guy named Jack Kirby patented the integrated circuit. And what he wrote in his patent application was a body of solid state conductor material where all the circuits are completely integrated. Kirby worked for Texas Instruments and their first customer was the US Air Force. This was followed by a tidal wave of investment from NASA, the Navy, and the Army, mostly for the space program and the missile programs of the day. That gave rise to present day Silicon Valley. So we've seen the way Government investment impacted early computing. How about software? Well, one of the most well-known software companies in the world is Google. And Google benefited from its very outset from government invention. Now, you wouldn't know that from the Project Maven reports that we read in the newspaper, but in 1994, the National Science Foundation gave six awards to something they called the Digital Language Initiative, DLI. DLI awards went to Stanford and other institutions, but Stanford's team was interested in looking at the internet as a collection of objects or a family tree. The lead researcher, Larry Page. Larry was quickly joined by Sergey Brin, and Google was spun out of that research four years later. So we've made our, our travel arrangements, we're on our way to the airport, and we call our Uber or our Lyft, our ride hailing services. Now these incredibly Innovative transportation companies would not exist without a, that aforementioned global positioning system. But the GPS did not always exist as the worldwide navigation constellation we know it of today. In fact, GPS started out as a Navy program called Transit in 1966. This provided navigation and timing signals to Navy ships at sea. So we've gotten to the airport, we're boarding our flight, and we look out on the wing and we see the modern jet engine. Now the modern jet engine is a marvel of complexity and technology. 
There are only five countries in the world that can design and manufacture the modern jet engine. The US, the UK, France, Italy, and Russia. Now, what about China? Well, if you read the papers, especially yesterday, you just realize they steal our designs. They can make them just fine. <laughs> now, the modern jet engine has been around since World War II. It made its combat debut with the German Air Force. But these jet engines had a fundamental limitation. They had a service life of about 10 to 20 hours. But the US and the UK saw the advantages of jets, and they invested massively. Metallurgy, components, technology. And by the 50s, all of our frontline fighters were jet powered. And by the 60s, all the commercial airliners were jet powered, revolutionizing air travel. So we're on our way, we're traveling, and what we don't see is the air traffic control system. Now the air traffic control system is a complex web of technology that provides safe separation and navigation guidance to airplanes in flight. It's operated and funded by the FAA. It's got a marvelous safety record. The FAA and the uh, air traffic control system handle an amazing 87,000 flights a day, 87,000. And those flights have an incredible safety record, one fatality for every 16 million flights. We made it safely to our destination. We're leaving our airplane. We weren't one of the fatalities. And once again, we pull out our cell phone and we call that ride-a-hailing app, uh, the Google, or the Uber, or the Lyft. It makes us think about the origins of touchscreen. Now, touchscreen has been around since the 60s, and the government invested in touchscreen in the 70s to a thing called capacitive touchscreen, but touchscreen really got its commercial debut in the 90s. This guy right here, Dr. Wayne Westerman, he was working as a researcher at the University of Delaware, and he was funded on a National Science Foundation grant. He took that research and spun off a company called Fingerworks, now, Fingerworks was bought by Apple Computer in 2005, and the first iPhone shipped with touchscreen in 2007. We've, we're in our car, we're traveling to our destination, and we wonder about the origins of voice recognition technology. Now, voice recognition technology mostly dates back to some DARPA research from 1971. That research was called Speech Understanding Research. And he had at its root something called the hidden Markov model. But that hidden Mar Markov model needed mathematics. And they were provided by this guy right here, Dr. Ellie Baum. Now, he was as smart as he looked. He was a Harvard mathematician, and he figured out those algorithms. He was working at Princeton's Institute for Defense Analysis, and he was funded by, yeah, you guessed it, Uncle Sam. So we've seen how the government investment in research and technology has, has affected every leg of our travel from our cell phones, to the way we get around, to the way we fly. What's next? Well, one interesting area is unmanned systems, or drones. Now, the first drone actually flew in World War II. It was called the Kettering Bug. This was a mere 15 years after the Wright Flyer flew at Kitty Hawk. Now, this thing, thank God, never saw combat. It looks a little scary to me. But the Kettering Bug was funded by the U.S. Army as an aerial torpedo or a drone, a, 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 a bomb of sorts. Drones continued to evolve in World War II, but all these drones lacked the significant navigation, guidance, and control that would make them truly useful intelligence, surveillance, or reconnaissance platforms. That is, until this thing right here, Project Amber. Project Amber was funded by DARPA in 1984 with $40 million. A company that won the competition was LSI, and they built an airplane called the Nat. Now, the Nat wasn't particularly impressive. It was pretty small, and it had a 28-foot wingspan, 15-foot fuselage, a single two-bladed prop. But what made the Nat special was it could stay airborne for 38 hours. And the Nat leveraged all those technologies we've been talking about, guidance, command and control, navigation, and computing. Now, Amber was canceled in the 90s, LSI went out of business, and they sold their assets to a company called General Atomics. But the Nat lives on today as perhaps the most famous of all drone aircraft, the MQ-1 Predator. Now, the Predators had a number of firsts. It was the first drone ever to be controlled internationally. It was the first drone to fly in the civilian airspace structure. And it was the first drone to be uploaded with weapons. But what made the Predator so special is it fundamentally changed the way we think about drone aircraft. So before Predator, we thought about drones as weapon systems. After Predator, we can think of drones doing just about anything. We see drones doing wind turbine inspection. 
We see drones doing medical supply drop. We even see drones doing household package delivery. Okay. Now the government invests in tech for different reasons than, than industry, we know that. And often we think of our government as, well, the villain. Or sometimes we think of our government as inept, or perhaps incompetent, or maybe clueless. And they're probably all of those things. But those government researchers, those government scientists, those government engineers that dedicate their life to this stuff have one advantage. And that advantage is they can do research over months or years or even decades. And that research, that technology, provides the innovation of today, but also the tech platform of the future. And I'm here to tell you from personal experience, that tech, more importantly, well, some night, somewhere, Someone's life's going to depend on it. Thank you.